could just remember I'm traveling on Thursday week. It's a long trip, two long flights, um, and then a busy schedule when we're there. Um, we're training firefighters as well in the basic ability to fight fires and, and other skills uh, over a week as well after that Sunday. Um, and then traveling home again of a very tight time frame in Dubai to catch my flight home. So after like one hour, I think one hour 15 between two long flights. So pray that I get that flight because I want to be home on the Sunday if I can. I don't want to have to stay in Dubai overnight to travel on the Monday. So pray that I get that flight. That's, uh, that'll be Sunday the 29th, I think we're due home. Um, so uh, do, do pray for that. I'm excited about it. Um, people who are going in the team, some of them, one of them in particular, is having a real hard time. The guy that's organising the trip uh, with his health massively. Pray for him that that this whole thing can be obviously put together as a team of twelve. Um, and I'm the only one from going from the UK, so um, yeah. So think about that, uh, and I'll give you a wee bit of an update hopefully next month when I'm back. So. Okay, um, so we're continuing with the Book of James. I'll be a little bit quicker this morning because we've took a bit of time up there. Um, James is still at it, all right, so just preparing you for that. He doesn't lay off at all, <laughs> and we're at the end of Chapter 3 today, 13 months in. We're at the end of Chapter 3. We will get it done before the end of 2023, God will. Um, so I'm reading verses 13 through to 18. I'm reading from the... English Standard Version, and I also like to give credit to R.T. Kendall's book that I've used for preparing this. Okay, so let's read these verses, and then we'll have a look at it. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, dem demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay, so verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And so G James is raising this question again, really. He's saying, who is wise and understanding among you? And really what he is doing, he has gone back to the thesis or to the premise that he has used throughout this book so far. And he is basically saying, who is living the Christian life? Who is living the Christ-like life? Who is personifying Jesus Christ in their lives? Now, remember, before we get into this today at all, James is talking to the first century church and therefore James is talking to us today. It's so easy whenever we read scripture to think that James is talking to someone other than us. It's easy when we read scripture to think that Paul is speaking to someone other than us. But the majority of the New Testament is written, the fact the whole Bible is written for us, but think about it in the context of what I'm saying, is the majority of the New Testament letters, yes, they were written to original readers, but it's for us, the church. That's what the majority of the Bible is for. And so we need to look at it in that light and think, right, well, I need to listen to this. And if James is still, let's use the phrase, still harping on about something that he's hammered to death for three chapters, then there has to be reason for us to actually believe that we need to listen to that as church. Yeah. And so James wants to know, he's asking the question quite clearly, who is wise among you? But what kind of wisdom is he talking about? And we've talked about wisdom before. James has talked about wisdom before. We know wisdom is something that is throughout Scripture. We know that you have the book of Proverbs, which is about wisdom in its entirety. Um, so what is the wisdom that James is talking about here? Because in these following verses, he talks about a divine wisdom or wisdom that's from above. And he talks about an earthly wisdom and a wisdom that is from below. And I suppose when he talks about that earthly wisdom, You've heard me using the phrase an oxymoron before. It is an actual word, and it means a contradiction in terms within the same sentence because if it's earthly wisdom, is it wisdom at all? But that's what he refers to it as, but he really slates it because he calls it demonic. And so we're going to look at that. And again, remember, as we read through this, he's talking to the church. 
to never lose sight of the fact that that's what he's doing. And James talks about these kind of things in terms of from below and from above before. You know that we've talked in chapter one about temptation being from below and how the spiral was good that goes downwards from temptation to sin and to death. And we know that he talks about things being from above as well. And we know that he talked about the great and good gifts, e.g. special grace and common grace coming from God and God alone. And so this is the type of phraseology that he's already used. And he says that temptation comes from below. And now there's this wisdom, which is a bitter jealousy and a selfish ambition. And that also comes from below. And we'll explain that what that means in a little point in a, a little minute or two. But let me ask the question before we go any further. And James has been hammering this for three chapters. I've been teaching you this for 13 months now. Have you got the message? All right. Now, I'm, this is James. Don't be, don't be looking at me. Okay. Do we think before we speak? Now, there, I'm telling you right now, there's the hardest thing right there. And we know that in, in this chapter, we know that James has also said in this chapter that it's impossible to control the tongue. I noticed something the other day that I said. It wasn't even bad. It wasn't something that I shouldn't have said. But I remember saying it and I th immediately thought, I didn't need to say that. And I didn't. And it was pointless saying. I was just repeating what someone else said. But I remember in that moment thinking, my mouth engaged completely before my brain did there. And it was in my mind only because I was preparing these. And I was thinking, that is how easy it is for us to say something. And I completely got in that moment... Why James says it's impossible to control the tongue. But yet we as Christians have to strive, and we have to strive that whenever we do communicate then, that it's a communication which is wisdom from above. And that's what we're going to look at here this morning. So this verse 13, King James Version says, Let him show out of a good conversation, interesting phrase, his words with weakness of wisdom. And so the King James is saying, this is about good conversation, but it's actually more than that. It's about our behavior. It's about our demonstration of Christ. And have we got the point that James is making yet in that are we living a Christ-like life? Are we living for him? Does our good works reflect what Jesus actually did for us on the cross? Because this Greek word for wisdom here, Sophia, and we looked at this a couple of months ago, is a quality. It's a quality, never an activity. Okay, an activity may be wise in its action, but wisdom demonstrated is always a quality. It's what we are. Are we reflecting it? Are we a reflection of Christ in our lives? If people look at you and look at I and look at how we live, what do they see? And yes, it's important that we proclaim. Yes, it's important that we communicate about Jesus Christ. Of course it is. We've all been called to do that. But whenever people look at us, on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock, for example, what do they see? Do they see what we say we are? Or do they see something entirely different? And remember who James is talking to here. And so the wisdom that James is talking about is the wisdom that is learned by the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We know that verse and fear is something that people don't like you talking about in this woke society that we live in. Children shouldn't be afeared, afraid of their parents, for example. People shouldn't be afraid of the police. Now, I remember when I was young, you'd, you'd have seen a policeman come and you'd have ran. Now, that's not that long ago, is it? Right? But how many people are afraid of that kind of thing now? And you see it in television with all the cameras and everything else, how people speak to people how children speak to their teachers and all now. And I'm not talking about people should be petrified. I'm talking about a reverential fear of something. And so whenever we fear God, of course we absolutely should fear God. Like we should fear running up the middle of the Tubbermore Road there with our eyes shut on a busy morning. You, you know the type of thing I'm talking about here. Because that's just a bit of common sense, isn't it? And so whenever we have a reverential fear of God, is that like us having the fear that actually protects and keeps and loves and cares. And so whenever the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, you can see that actually it's our relationship with God that is the beginning of wisdom. And that is what James is talking about here. It's not about intelligence. It's not about our craft or skill. And James says, who among you is wise? He's asking the question, 
So I ask the question that James is asking this morning is who amongst us in this room this morning is wise as the Bible talks about? Because if we claim to have that kind of wisdom, then it will be evident in our conversation. It will be evident in our behavior. It will be evident in our good works. And it will be evident in our meekness of wisdom because the verse talks about meekness. But the minute we think we're meek is the minute that we're not meek. So this is where it's actually difficult for us to consider anything. But I ask the question again, if you consider this as you, what do people see in you? And are you going to be honest enough with yourself to actually recognize that maybe they don't see the best in me at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning? And so this is exceedingly rare. Even amongst the church, it is absolutely rare. Why do you think James has spent three chapters so far hammering this whole thing about word and works? And he's going to, by the way, the next two chapters are just more of the same. Just prepare yourself for that. This is five chapters on godliness. And he talks about the same thing over and over and over again. It's exceedingly rare, but yet open to all. Are you an ambitious person? Are you highly motivated? Well, here's the greatest challenge right here. Here is the greatest challenge, and are you up for it? And the greatest challenge is, are you going to live like Christ in everything that we do? And see if you are thinking along the terms of what I'm talking about. It's amazing how many times in the week you go, uh-oh, failed again. Uh-oh, failed again. And it's amazing how the preacher who's preparing this stuff all the time, who, and it's in my head, I recognize that probably more than most people in the room, only because I'm the one that's about to get up here on a Sunday morning and tell you how to live your life. And on Saturday, I'm going, oh my goodness, there I go again, right? So, excuse my behavior, but everybody listen to what these words of James is saying. And it's not linked to education, by the way. It's not linked to whether you've been to Bible college or not. It's not linked to money. It's not linked to natural ability. But rather, as I've already said, to your relationship with God Almighty. This separates the men from the boys. This separates the women from the girls, just to be fair, and an equal society there, all right? This, this is what separates if you're serious or not. James started this chapter, remember, as well, and here's a word of warning to the teachers, because remember how James started this chapter was to the Bible teachers. And this applies here as well. That theme carries out throughout this chapter, because there's nothing worse than having an ability to teach and then fail miserably because... I don't have the godly walk or the good, the good works or the honor of the calling that God has called me to. That is why, hopefully, you can see why James absolutely says that those who stand up here to tell you how to live your life are actually going to be judged more harshly. Hopefully, you can see now that we've spent three months on chapter three as to why that is the case. And so we need to demonstrate the wisdom that God is talking about here, that James is talking about in the life that we lead. It must be shown. James has already used this kind of language. In chapter 2, verse 18, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so what he's saying here in chapter 3, he's saying, I will show you wisdom by my works. I will show you the godly wisdom that I'm about to explain to you by the works, by, by the personification of Christ in my life, if you like. And what I do each and every day. Three ways as to how we can do that. Firstly, a blameless lifestyle. Out of good conversation, King James says, actually means behavior. Out of good behavior. So works means nothing if it's not backed up by a godly lifestyle. So if we're going to demonstrate this wisdom that James is talking about, this wisdom that's from heaven, then we have to have a blameless lifestyle. And I'm telling you, that's really difficult. Hopefully people in the room would explain would agree with me when I say that. It's extremely difficult. And before this day's out, if you're listening to my words this morning, trust me, at some point you'll go, Big Lab was right this morning, all right? Before you go to bed tonight, if you're all honest with yourselves, you're going to say or do something or think something. And don't be thinking it as the Big Lab was right. Think about it as what James says, all right? Second thing is good works. And we've hammered that one to death. Absolutely, because James has talked on and on and on about that. And that makes us uncomfortable. And I keep coming back to the idea that whenever we talk about good works in the church in the West, it makes us uncomfortable. It shouldn't because we have this idea that it's linked to salvation in some way. And hopefully we've explained that well over the recent months that it is not. It is a demonstration of our faith in Jesus Christ. We're not saved by good works. 
but we are absolutely judged by the world as to whether we're living good or not. And so that's the second thing that we, if we have it, we can demonstrate that we have this wisdom that is from above. And the third thing is that meekness. And we know that the third beatitude says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Proof of this wisdom is the meekness that char characterizes it, because this meekness will always be self-effacing. Okay? We should never be trying to promote ourselves. Yeah? We should never be trying to do that. And that's hard sometimes. It's probably particularly hard for maybe people in the position that we're in, the people who are at the front. It is so difficult not to go to that place sometimes. And that's something that I continuously, just being honest with you, as part of testimony as well, I struggle with that. And whenever I get opportunities to do things, I think, is that going to be something for me or is that going to be something for God? And, and, and as teachers, we have to be mindful of that. As anybody in Christian life, we have to be mindful of that. Of course we do. Because the minute we think we've cracked it, we've lost the meekness one, if you understand me. And so what about this counterfeit wisdom, this wisdom from below? I'll, I will get through this quicker today. This counterfeit wisdom from below. Verses 15 and 16. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That's pretty serious words. Remember, he's talking to the church. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And so James starts by saying, talks about the earthly wisdom, as he's referring to it as, before he talks about what the godly wisdom which is from above. And you and I, we can all fall into this trap. Is it possible to be godly and wrong at the same time? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'll, I'll help you out. Every hand should be up. Is it possible to be godly and wrong? Of course it is. Otherwise, the Bible didn't need to be written. Yeah? And so godly people, is it possible, it might shock you, can have an unbridled tongue. That might shock you. Does it? Have you ever heard a Christian criticizing someone? Have you ever been involved in a little bit of gossip yourself? This is what James says, not me. And so this, is it possible... The Christian or godly people, people who are saved and genuinely saved, can still get it wrong. We can still say stuff that we shouldn't say. Verse 15 says that our actions could be earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. James is not holding back yet again. James also says that this could be deemed wisdom, but it's not the kind that is from above. This is for us. This is for us. Don't be thinking this is for somebody else this morning. This is for us. It is... It is possible to be wrong, and it's possible to be very wrong. And so we must examine ourselves in every scenario and situation and ask ourselves the question, what is my motivation right now? Because it is so easy, even as church leaders or anybody in the Christian faith, it is so easy to get drawn into something that is a personal opinion, and we don't even realize it sometimes. And sometimes we may even think that God has put our personal opinion there. And I know that that is difficult, but the only way to get that to the bottom of that is to get before God honestly and to ask yourselves in every moment and every situation and every scenario, why am I saying what I'm saying? Because it's quite possible, as Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick or wicked who can understand it. And it is absolutely possible that we can get to that place where we think we're speaking for God and we're not. Even those of us in a leadership positions it is so easy to get there and if we're not even aware that we may have a bitter jealousy or a selfish ambition on our hearts then what guess what we will give satan an even greater opportunity to have victory over us do not be deceived we all think we can outgrow preaching i'm telling you right now that it's possible that you may be sitting in here this morning and thinking i don't need to hear that again I'm telling you, if James feels the need to repeat this time and time and time again here for three chapters so far, then there's a need for you and I to realize this every week, every month, whatever the case might be. Is it possible, let me ask the question, to get to the point where Christians, where we think we don't need Bible study, or in this case, James, or what he has to say? Of course it's possible. It's possible for, possible for all of us to be sitting under leadership or under teaching and think, well, I heard that last month, I got it last month. Did you get it last month? Because if you're sitting here thinking that you understand what I'm saying, then that's not meekness. Is that fair enough? And so in the very moment we should be thinking, actually, I need to think about this. 
whether I've sussed it or not, I still need to think about it. And I'll tell you better than that, if we get to the place where we have meekness of wisdom, we'll actually be the first who wants to listen to it. Because then that's showing you actually you are getting to the place where there's heavenly wisdom demonstrated in your life. Never assume that you won't slip into ungodly behavior. Don't ever feel superior. Don't think that your reaction to something is always divinely given. Be humble and recognize that you need God all the time because it is temptation to think that you've arrived and can do no wrong. And it is a supreme test of your spirituality to be able to judge yourself and realize that your reaction may actually be quite wrong. And if you know that you're wrong, don't keep saying it to save face. I know people, and I'm sure you do too, where they've said something, they know it's wrong, but because they've once said it, they have to keep saying it. And I've read stuff, and R.T. Kendall, you know, he's one of my favorite authors, I read others, but R.T., he's been writing books for 60 years probably, and I know, and he'll acknowledge in his books that he said something in a book 20 years ago that he now doesn't agree with. And I know, as a as a, as somebody who studies doctrine, who studies scripture, that I know that my theology from time to time changes. And I, I thank God for the first time I went to Bible college in 2005, I think it was, and I remember the principal at that time saying, write your theology in pencil. And I remember listening to him that night as the young, well, maybe not so young, younger version of me, thinking, why would I do that? Well, boys, oh, in the last 15, 18 years, I'm telling you that sometimes I think differently about certain aspects of theology now than I did then. I don't think that's wrong. I don't change the fundamentals, by the way. No, 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 no. But if there's been scholars and academics fighting over certain aspects of Scripture for hundreds of years, and people who we know are absolutely well saved in this world will have different positions on certain subjects, then I'm not going to be the expert who works it all out. But what I do know this is that I need to get before God and understand to the best of my ability what it is that I believe. And sometimes whenever I do that, that may change. I mean, one example of that is the example of the doctrine of grace. They've been fighting over years, centuries over that one. That's the idea of being saved. And always saved, once saved, always saved, or saved and lost. Like, I'm not going to get into the debate of that. I've studied it lots in the last couple of years. But I know that what I'm saying here is correct, in that if I have a position theologically that I've taught once, and then somehow discover that it's maybe not as accurate as I thought, do I keep teaching it for the rest of my life because I once said it? There's arrogance in that, isn't there? And I'm not dis displaying meekness. The point that I'm making is, is that, even those of us right up here, sometimes we can get it wrong. And we're sitting in this room and we're talking to other Christians about things, even in a counseling scenario, you may get it wrong. I mean, if I asked you to really deep into, de de delve deep into the recesses of your heart, think over your life, did you ever say something wrong to somebody in a Christian context? I'll be surprised if you didn't come up with the answer, yes, I probably did. And if we get to the bottom of the motivation of that, maybe we start to understand as to why. The point here is that I'm not beating you up here. The point I'm making is that we have to recognize that actually we're human. And actually it is quite possible that we can get something wrong. And that's not the sin bit. The sin bit is if we recognize that and we keep on doing it because we're demonstrating earthly wisdom rather than godly wisdom. Yeah? Because if we keep lying against something that we know then we're lying against the truth. It is possible to be wrong in the moment, even if you're usually right on the whole. Absolutely possible. And so we need to look at everything whenever we're at it. So back to the text very, very quickly. The wisdom from below is counterfeit wisdom, so it is not really wisdom at all. Anyone can be sidetracked here. James says this wisdom is characterized in the three following ways. I'm going to do this very, very, very quickly. He starts off by, it's a downward spiral, as you notice this, because he says, first of all, it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. And you can see where he talks about this downward trajectory again. Remember we talked about the upward trajectory, trajectories, trajectories within James, and we've talked about the downward ones. And it's interesting whenever he's describing this earthly wisdom that Christians can demonstrate, he also uses a downward trajectory. So first of all, earthly. Secondly, unspiritual. Thirdly, demonic. 
I'm not going to go into the Greek words of those who had them here, but I'm not going to take the time. But firstly, earthly is commensurate with common grace. And it's not special grace. That good gift that God gives where people have an ability that aren't even saved. When we talked about that before, people can be great doctors, for example, and heal people with inventions of antibiotics and all that kind of thing. That's common grace. It's not linked to being a Christian or not a Christian. And so whenever we demonstrate some earthly wisdom sometimes, that's exactly what it could be linked to that common grace, that ability for us to be smart sometimes, but yet it's not God. And non-Christians would do the same thing in that given situation. If it's unspiritual, the word Paul uses to describe, that's the word, uh, the Greek word for that is the word that Paul uses to describe those who are not saved, by the way. And also it's the word that Jude, Jude uses for hypocrites. Is that word there that's used for unspiritual. And again, this is how non-Christians would react in a given situation. And James is saying, you should be different than that. That's what he's saying. And thirdly, demonic. The devil himself can get in on the act. And it is possible that the Christian will be very instrumental to the devil. Is that possible? Are you shocked by that this morning? That we in the church can actually do the devil's work for him? Maybe, I don't know. Is it a shock? It shouldn't be a shock. It shouldn't be a shock. Because absolutely we can do the devil's work for him. You become blind to objectivity and preoccupied by how you feel about something. So then look, let's look at this godly wisdom quickly. This godly wisdom which is from above. Verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure. And it's peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. If this godly wisdom is manifested in us, it ensures that our witness in the world will be all that God meant it to be. The wisdom that comes from above is not intelligence. It's not a natural gift. It's not even common grace. It is a special thing. It is an anointing. It is an unction. Have you heard of that word? It's an old word. Unction. Chrisma is the Greek word for that. I want to tell you that this morning. Chrisma, unction. Because this is the consequence of God dealing with us. Remember how James started this epistle. What did he say? Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of every kind. Because it's the testing of your faith that produces perseverance. So then that you will lack nothing and be mature and perfect in everything. And so James starts by talking about how we face stuff. And so now we're starting to see as to why it is that we face stuff. You may even think about this in terms of my children. I, I've had conversations with my two older children this week. And I've just been thinking about them. And as a father, of course I don't want them to face stuff. But then as the Bible teacher, I'm sitting going, well, I can't expect everybody else to face stuff because of what James says. And then not expect that the people that I love will face stuff. Yeah. And this is something that goes around in my head all the time. And I sit and think, God, I would take the pain of the world upon me if it was to save others. But then you're working in them too. And so whenever we look at the likes of what James is saying, he's saying that this is the kind of thing that produces the anointing in your life. And R.T. Kendall says that the greater the suffering, the greater the anointing. The greater the suffering, the greater the unction. And so if we're sitting here this morning and expecting never to face any hardship in our lives, guess what? You're not going to do anything for God. Because if you want to be sold out for God, then you're going to have to go through the, the cauldron in order to be purified, in order to be the place where Christ wants you to be. And it's sad if we actually go through all of that stuff and we never become what Christ wants us to be. And I'm telling you right now, there are many Christians on the road for decades who never quite get this idea. And they go through all sorts of stuff and they're just better about it all of the time. And nothing ever changes and they don't carry an anointing. And forgive me for saying it, but hopefully you've expect nothing less from me now. Yeah? And so if we want a Holy Ghost anointing and an unction in our lives, don't expect not to go through some stuff. And whenever you go through that stuff, don't create havoc with God because of it. Because it is amazing whenever we even sing our songs and say, God, have your way in us. And then God has his way in us. And five minutes into the way, we go, God, but I don't want it to be that way. Right? And so if we're going to serve God in this world, in these closing years of this existence, decades, whatever it will be, I'm telling you right now that if we're going to do something for God, this is the kind of message that you've got to get. And it said 
few minutes ago, it's exceedingly rare. Exceedingly rare, even within the church. Are we going to be those people? Now you see why my brain never shuts off, because I think about all of these things. All the, I don't like being a Bible teacher sometimes, I tell you that. Because then I have to think about it. I'm kind of forced to think about it. And it is surprising and refreshing and always brings great relief. Heavenly wisdom. Yeah? How do you recognize this godly wisdom? And we're nearly finished. Purity and peace. I'm going to fly through these. Purity and peace. This pureness means blameless. So if we're understanding this wisdom, if we're the person who's involved in the wisdom, or if we're hearing the wisdom, or if we're seeing the wisdom, then the wisdom that is from above is blameless. It is pure. It is void of ambivalence. Do you know what that word means? It means a laissez-faire attitude. I can't care. Okay, that's what ambivalence is. So it's void of ambivalence. It's void of personal feeling. It is void of private vendetta. It's unconditional. It's void of dependence or obligation to anyone. And so whenever we're living our lives, and what did James talk about a lot in chapter 2 was about partiality and favoritism. I'm telling you, the church is full of that. And we covered that, so I'm not going to go back there. But we, when we're demonstrating the wisdom that is from God, we can't be man or women pleasers. And I'm telling you, that's something that we all struggle with. I recognize that it's something that I struggle with. And yet we can't be fierce and in people's faces. Never that, because we present the truth in love. And I've told you that before. We will always tell the truth, but we have to tell it in a loving way. And we have to care about the people that we're talking to. And we can't lose sight of that because I think that you're into all sorts of other territory whenever you do that. The purity of it is confirmed by the peace of it. When it comes, when, when it is God's wisdom, you will just know it. When a preacher is speaking with unction or anointing, we may not like the content, but we know that it's right. And I'm not talking about me here this morning, but I'm telling you how many times in your life, as in mine, when I've had a preacher preaching to me and he's took me very eyebrows off, yeah? And I go home and I sit and I think about it and I know, do you know what? I don't like it, but he's right. Or she's right. And so it's possible that you're hearing this kind of thing this morning. You may go out that door angry with me every month. That's okay. But if I'm preaching with an anointing and I'm not saying that I am, but if I am, you will recognize that at some point when you go through that door. Gentleness and openness is another characteristic of this wisdom. Wisdom from above is always gentle. God will not lead you to do something that is ridiculous. Okay? Remember someone, I've told this story before, where someone was about to give their entire life up and go to Brazil because somebody gave them a Brazil nut. And you've heard me tell the joke before, I'm glad they never gave you a Mars bar. Right? And that sounds ridiculous, but I'm telling you, there are people out there and that's how they live their lives. Now, don't get me wrong. God if, could call people to Brazil. No shock in that. But God's not going to just in a moment. Like I remember, personal story, let's get back into it again. On the third, what did I say? Yes, the 13th of July, 2005, whenever I heard the audible voice of God telling me in that moment to go to America and preach on the divinity of God, I had absolutely no doubt whatsoever that God spoke to me. But guess what? If I had a win on the 14th of July, it would have been all in my strength. Now, I expected to be going on the 14th of July and then the 15th of July. And guess what? Life sort of went a wee bit desperate after that for a number of years. Why? Because I wasn't ready for it. Do you see the point that I'm making? And I, the first time I preached in America was in 2010, five years after that. And then another five years before I preached in America, 2015, and quite regularly since then. But guess what? God didn't take me from A to Z in that moment of July 2005. Because A, I would have ruined it. B, I probably would never have managed it. C, I'd have been destroyed probably in the midst of it all. God takes us from A to B to C to D to E. And he may give us the opportunity to let us know what it is that we're going to do specifically. But then he says, right, guess what? I'm going to have to get you ready for it. And sometimes that takes longer than you think. Moses, 40 years in the wilderness. Joseph, 13 years in prison. Do I need to go on? King David, 13 years from his anointed to he was king. I'm completely off my notes, and it's 10 past 1. Do you know the point that I'm making? And whenever the devil said to Jesus, 
when he was being tempted, cast yourself down from here. And the devil knew his Bible and he, say, he quoted Psalm 91, verse 11. The angel, God will provide his angels to protect you wherever you go. The devil quoted that to Jesus. Jesus knew he was quoting the Bible. Jesus said, I'm not going to do that because you don't test the Lord your God. Yeah? But Jesus could have thrown himself down. And the angels would have saved him. But the point I'm making is that God's not going to ask you to do something ridiculous. Yes, he may ask you to do something miraculous. He will ask you to do something massive. But God will prepare you to do it. No? Of course he will. And as Uncle Bert says this morning, if God asks, he provides. And if God decides, you will do it. If you're willing. I read the story. I'm completely off my notes. I read the story about Art, uh, uh, Bunky, Reinhard Bunky. You know who that is? He's dead now. I think the ministry to date is something like 80 million decisions in Africa. They had over 1 million decisions in a single meeting in the year 2000. I could talk about that man's ministry forever and a day. He's in heaven today. God bless him. He's loving life right now with all those, all that hard work for God. But it's amazing how he believes in his autobiography. You've maybe read it, you maybe have not. That he believes that he was the third person that God asked to go to Africa to do the ministry that he did. And Daniel Kalendo is now continuing on with upwards of nearly 100 million decisions for Christ based on that ministry alone. Now, if God can do that, with, now I'm not saying that's, right, that's what Reinhardt has said. I'm not saying that's accurate. That's what he says. But is it possible? Yeah. And so if you and I want to serve God to the best of our ability, we need to actually start getting realistic and real about what it is that God is doing with us. And if you're going through difficult times and seasons in your life, there's usually a good indication there that God's getting you ready for something. And so we never shorten it. That's the point. It's the easiest thing in the world to solve our own problems. But if God's doing something, you've got to let him do it. You've got to let him do it because God is preparing something in your life. Yeah, and I'm going to say something else this morning. Whenever I heard that audible voice of God on the 13th of July, 2005, and whenever I said to God that night, yes, had I known what the next 17, 18 years was going to bring, I'm not so sure I could have said yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? But God has brought me along, and he has put me where I am right now, and it doesn't matter whether... You hear me or you don't hear me this morning, and as long as I know in my heart, and I have to ask myself uh, every day, am I serving you, God, or am I serving me, God? And as long as I can answer that, then I have to do what God has asked me to do. This wisdom will not put others down. You will be easily persuaded. It is mercy and good fruits. God doesn't need to get even with us. He deals with us in mercy. God is rich in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4. Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If vengeance is handed to you on a silver platter, walk away from it. I'm telling you, we're all human. And very often, if we think that we're going to get the opportunity to deal with something, don't dress it up as God has given you the opportunity. Because God says, vengeance is mine. Vengeance isn't yours. God also says that he will provide vindication always. And if you get the opportunity for somehow providing your own vindication, let me tell you right now, don't even pray about it. You're not in the will of God. I'm shouting this morning. Pastor, is that all right? I'm going to have a sore throat. I didn't mind to shout this morning. I planned not to shout this morning. I'm nearly done. Impartial and sincere. Remember, those Christian Jews had shown partiality and favoritism, and it was wrong. This wisdom for all is without bias. It transcends personal feeling, and it also has to be and must be without hypocrisy. Sorry for flying through that last wee bit there. Hopefully we've got the message. As we get here to the end of chapter 3 and what James has been teaching us, we've been looking at this now for 13 months. I would say there's another six or eight months in it before we get through these final two chapters hopefully you'll remove my ramblings this morning and we hear what the word of god says yeah and yet if you're watching online you can be saved do you know what the one thing that i COVID has brought is that everywhere i speak now it's usually recorded and it's usually online somewhere either live or afterwards and it's amazing how 
God can use all things and how the whole thing of COVID has exploded the online world for people like me teaching. I teach every Monday night on Zoom to people from different parts of the world and COVID actually brought that around. I wish I owned a Zoom before COVID hit. We'd be very rich today and I don't wish that by the way but I'm just making a point. Um, and so the, the, the fact is if you're watching online you have the opportunity to respond to the gospel message and it's so easy. You can give your life to Jesus Christ by recognizing that you're born in sin and all you have to do is turn away from that life, believe that Jesus died for you on the cross, that he rose again. And all you have to do is believe that and you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. And if that's what you want to do, contact the church here whenever you're watching this. Uh, and, and they'll pray with you. They'll help you or seek out a Christian friend, a good Christian friend that goes to an evangelical church that you know. And so the same message for us in here this morning. But I just want to pray for us here this morning. Hopefully that you'll not have heard any of my ramblings this morning. Forgive me that for the first Sunday, uh, well, it's the second Sunday, but the first Sunday that I've been teaching in the new year, you'll forgive me, I had a lot of calories over Christmas. All right, I'm sure we all have. Um, and let me just pray. Let me just pray. Lord, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we just thank you that from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, Lord, there is so much in there. Lord, it was written by 40 different people over a 1,500-year period. And Lord, we know that it is living and active. And Lord, we know that it is absolutely, completely God-breathed and inspiring for each and every one of us. So Lord, forgive us if we look at any portion of it and somehow don't think that it's for us. Because, Lord, your word is for us from start to end. And, Lord, your word is for this world. And, Lord, your word is for us to trust in and believe and stand on, never compromise, and to present to this world. And so, Lord, we thank you that James has taught us about wisdom that is from above versus wisdom from beneath. And, yes, he's talking to us as the church. So, Lord, the next time that we're about to... Uh, somehow delve into the world of earthly wisdom. Lord, help us to remember James's word where he, where he says that that is actually demonic. And Lord, help us to recognize that our wisdom that we demonstrate should absolutely be in the demonstration of good works that we have for you and the living of the life that you have called us to live as per what the word of God says. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord, for everybody in here this morning at the start of this new year, Lord, as we reflect on what's important to us, Lord, help us all to recognize that the most important thing to us is our relationship with you, loving you, loving others, and presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ in whatever format that takes for us. And so, Lord, I pray too, if there are people watching this video, Lord, I, that they will respond to you in faith. Lord, that you will draw them onto you and that many people will give their hearts and lives to you as a result of your word of God going forth. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Keep us safe until we see each other again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.